Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 46, a topsy-turvy world. We're still in the year 1130, but now we're moving swiftly on. The church is breaking apart into a schism and Lothar III sides, with what turns out to be the winning side, clever, and then mucks up the negotiations, not clever, and then he dies. Before we start, just a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generous support from patrons, and you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website, historyofthegermans.com. You'll find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Paul, Nathan and Ollie who've already signed up. Last week we ran through the huge divisions that split the papacy in 1130. Two sides oppose each other. On the one hand, you have the old Gregorian Reform Party, represented by the papal bankers, the Pier Leone, the grand old monastery of Cluny, and the emerging scholastic method, trying to marry logic and faith. On the other side, you have an even less likely alliance. It's the successes of the old aristocratic thugs and the new monastic reform movement of Bernard of Clairvaux that is underpinned by its own brand of ecstatic mysticism. Lothar III had managed to keep himself outside of all these debates as long as Pope Honorius II was alive. He did pretty much whatever Honorius II or his papal legates wanted him to do. Appoint Norbert as Archbishop of Magdeburg, make this guy the abbot of Fulda, yes sir, yes sir. Lothar was at risk of being seen as a papal minion. This may have been a necessity, since before 1130, Lothar needed the support of the German bishops against Frederick of Hohenstaufen, and most importantly, he needed to prevent a coronation of Conrad as emperor at all cost. And that meant keeping the Pope sweet until the Hohenstaufens are defeated. Now that the Hohenstaufen are about to be kneeling in the dust before him, the only thing Lothar needs from the church now is his coronation. Pope Honoris II had invited him to come down to Rome to be crowned years ago, and once Speyer had fallen, it was time to go. But it was also too late. By 1130, Honoris II was gravely ill. Another papal election was looming, and the two sides were getting ready. Though Honoris II was their pope, the Frangipani had seen their position eroding these last few years. Many of the cardinals had gradually veered towards the more conservative spectrum and might like to see an old-school Gregorian candidate on the throne of St. Peter. Now that conservative candidate to succeed Honoris II, the Frangipani are so worried about, was none other than the head of the opposing Pier Leone family, Cardinal Pietro Pier Leone. I know what you're thinking, but no, Pietro Perleone is not a 22-year-old dissolute scoundrel. Au contraire, Perleone was a man of great reform zeal and unquestioned piety. His scholarly credentials were impeccable. He had studied in Paris at the feet of the great scholastic Peter Abelard. After that, he had been a monk at Cluny before being made papal legate, first in France and then in England. So, eminently suitable but in all and everything a red rag to Cardinal Emmerich and the Frangipani. And so the Frangipani opened the gambit by seizing the dying pontiff on February 11th and dragging him half-dead to the monastery of Sant'Andrea. They put him into a nice warm cell and invited the minority of cardinals they could trust to come and help them elect a new pope. And now all that before the old pope was even dead, an unprecedented breach of etiquette. Word of their doings got out, and the other cardinals threatened anathemas against the Fungipani should they dare to elect the Pope before Honoris II was dead and buried. In the negotiations that followed, the parties agreed a new procedure. Given that Honoris was on his last leg, and if a schism was to be avoided, the next Pope needed to be elected very, very quickly. There was no room for lengthy debates in the full College of Cardinals, let alone inviting those currently out on mission. The Curia decided that for this particular case, a committee of eight cardinals should elevate a new pope as soon as the funeral of Honoris II had been held. 
and Frangipani were not really happy about this arrangement, since only three of the eight cardinals were part of their camp, making the whole thing a foregone conclusion. But then any other electoral method would have had the same outcome. The Frangipani had only a minority in the College of Cardinals, irrespective of which election methods you use. Now on February 13th, the rumour swirled around the city that Honoris II had died. An angry mob surrounded the monastery where it had been brought. The Frangipani somehow managed to prop the dying Pope up onto the balcony where he waved to the crowd for one last time. Everyone calmed down and went home. It is not yet time. But that same night, Honorius II died. Now normally a Pope would lie in state for three days, and only after he was buried would the election process begin. Hence the eight cardinal electors in San Marco waited. Not so the Frangipani. Honorius' body was not even cold before they threw him into a shallow grave in the courtyard of the monastery, said some hasty prayers, and burial done, moved on to elect a new pope. They chose Gregory Papareschi, the cardinal deacon of Sant'Angelo, to be their new pope. By daybreak, they took him to the Lateran, where he was hastily installed as Innocent II on the throne of St. Peter, before he was brought to one of the strongest Frangipani fortresses inside the city to see what happens next. By now, a crowd had gathered outside the small church of San Marco where some of the eight cardinal electors were gathered. The three Frangipani supporters had gone home earlier. When news came through of Innocent II's hasty election and enthronization, it was uproar. The five cardinal electors present declared the election of Innocent II uncanonical. The Frangipani and their three colleagues, whose absence was now explained, were excommunicated. And they then proceeded to elect Pietro Perleoni as Pope Anaclet II. And there we are again, a schism. But this time a schism without involvement of the Emperor. Over the subsequent days, Anaclet II gradually gained the upper hand in Rome. The generous distribution of Pierleoni money to all and sundry ensured he could quickly take the Lateran and after that St. Peter. A week later, Anaclet II was formally enthroned in old St. Peter with all the pomp and circumstances that comes with the papal inauguration. Meanwhile, Innocent II was still in Rome, but his followership began to dwindle. As Pierleoni money found its way into the Frangipani fortress, he feared for his life and he fled the holy city. Anaclet II is now in control of the holy city, but though the Pierleoni were rich, they were not rich enough to bribe the whole of Christendom. Innocent II's journey north turned out to be more of a triumphal progress than a flight. Pisa cheered him on, as did Genoa. From there he travelled to France. And when he disembarked in St. Giles, he was greeted by none other than the abbot of Cluny. This move of his old abbey against Anaclet was a bad start. The Council of Etampes, France declared wholeheartedly for Innocent II. King Louis VI, by now an old and enormously fat man, kissed the papal feet. Even King Henry I of England came down to Chartres to honour the new Pope. The reason for this miraculous rise from a more than dodgy election and a subsequent expulsion from Rome can be summarised in one word, or in one name, Bernard of Clairvaux. The silver-tongued preacher had sided with Innocent II, claiming that, though fewer cardinals had voted for Innocent II, these cardinals had been the righteous and the most senior ones. He even pushed the argument that the Pier Leone had only recently converted from Judaism, and who could ever let a Jewish convert onto the throne of St. Peter? Well, I assume nobody dared to enlighten St. Bernard about St. Peter's religious affiliations before he became an apostle. What surprises here more than the weakness of the arguments is that it was completely obvious to all and everyone that Bernard of Clairvaux was utterly biased. The Frangipani faction and their Pope Innocent II were supporters of Bernard. The Pier Leone and their Pope stood for all that Bernard despised. The old Cluniac style of monasticism, the scholastic learning and the church reform style of Gregory VII. But such was the authority of the erudite spiritualist that everyone fell in line. 
the great churchmen of the time, and most importantly the three leaders of the great monastic orders, obviously the Cistercians, but also the Premonstratensians, and even the Cluniacs, despite the fact that Anaclet II had been a monk in Cluny. Everyone was now with Innocent II. Well, not everyone yet. For Lothar III, the schism had created both an opportunity and a problem. On the one hand, there was a formally correctly elected Pope down in Rome, whose position was weak and who could be made to do the three things Lothar III wanted. Crown him emperor, hand over the lands of Matilda of Tuscany, and even revise the Concordat of Worms. But then there was Bernard of Clairvaux. If Lothar sided with Anaclet, St. Bernard would start preaching against him. And if he would contest his election or coronation, could Lothar still hold his position against the Hohenstaufen? On the other hand, supporting Innocent II meant he would need to fight his way into the city of Rome to gain his crown, something that took Henry IV nearly five years. The choice was Anaclet and Anarchy or Bernard and Battle. Lothar hesitated and hesitated and hesitated. Anaclet sent him letter after letter. He even excommunicated Conrad of Hohenstaufen to show his goodwill. Still, no response. Anaclet II is now starting to panic. Apart from King David of Scotland and the Duke of Aquitaine, nobody outside Rome is on his side. He needs help. And there's always, always an option for a Pope in the 12th century who needs help. And that option is called the Normans. But it comes with strings attached. Roger II, great Count of Sicily, is their leader now. Roger had managed to acquire the duchies of Apulia and Calabria from the descendants of his famous uncle, Robert Giscard. Nearly all of southern Italy, south of Rome, is now in the hands of just one man. And that man wants something, and he wants it badly. And that is a crown. Anaclet II is prepared to give him a crown if he is willing to defend him against whoever and whatever is coming down to Rome. And so, on Christmas Day 1130, Roger of Audeville, descendant of a minor but extremely fecund Norman baron, was crowned King of Sicily in the Cathedral of Palermo in the presence of Latin and Greek bishops, as well as the papal legate. After that, Lothar could no longer sit on the fence. It was decision time. Roger claiming to be king was a terrible affront to imperial dignity. Since his Ottonian predecessors had ridden south and Saxon weapons ruled all the way to the heel of Italy, all of it was part of empire. Or that at least was what Lothar believed. Going to Rome had at the same time now become more necessary as well as more difficult. Re-establishing imperial rule in Italy and a crown were appealing, but not enough to justify the risk. If Innocent II really wanted him to go and recapture Rome for him, he would need to make some concessions. The Concordat of Worms should be reopened. The emperor may get the right of investiture and hence control over the imperial church back. Maybe we could be dialing the clock back to Henry III. I mean, everybody's giddy with excitement. So in 1131, Innocent II travelled to meet Lothar in Liège to hammer out the terms. As the Pope approaches the town, Lothar comes out to greet him. Lothar descends from his horse and takes the reins of the papal white horse, leading him into town. Once arrived, he holds the papal stirrups as the pontiff descends. These services, the straighter service and the service of the marshal, had never before been performed by a king of the Romans, let alone by an emperor. Only the son of Henry IV did perform the straighter service to Urban II after he had betrayed his father and was aiming to be crowned king of Italy. But no actual or future emperor had yet humiliated himself so far as to act as papal groom. That is, what mere kings may be obliged to do, but not an emperor. It is hard to believe but it seems that Lothar thought this was just some sort of act of courtesy, with no further meaning for the relationship between emperor and pope. Because as soon as the preliminaries were over, Lothar sat down to negotiate. 
He basically said, okay, I get you down to Rome and even risk war with Roger of Sicily, but in exchange, you let me invest the bishops again. I mean, fair dues. Innocent must accept this. No longer can the papacy use the divisions amongst the German nobles to push their position. It is time for the emperor to exploit the divisions within the church, right? Not right, says Bernard of Clairvaux. He leaps from his chair and subjects the emperor to a merciless castigation before the entire assembly, calling upon him to renounce his pretensions there and then and pay unconditional homage to the rightful pope, a pope he had acted as groom for just now. How dares he challenging his rightful lord? 10 out of 10 for balls. Lothar is so stunned, he does not know what to say. He had not realized that his negotiation position had already been wiped out when he held the papal stirrup. This is the 12th century, and images count more than a thousand words. Who needs to negotiate with a mere stable boy? The great opportunity to get it all back is gone. Lothar agrees to take Innocent II down to Rome, and all he expects in exchange is the coronation. And that is exactly what Lothar did. That, and no more. He took an army of just 1,500 knights down to Italy. It seemed a ridiculously low number, given that Anaclet had an alliance with Roger II, who could raise ten times that in a heartbeat. And even though the Hohenstaufen were much reduced, the situation in Germany was still fragile. One anecdote may illustrate that. On his way to the Brenner Pass, Lothar and his army stayed in the city of Augsburg, the king was suspicious of the bishop and of the inhabitants of the city, believing them to harbour pro hohenstaufen sympathies. A few weeks earlier, they had attacked and robbed a papal envoy who had made the mistake of passing near the city limits. Nevertheless, Lothar was greeted with deference, and the bishop even promised to punish the perpetrators of the crimes harshly. Whilst king and bishop were still debating the issue, some tumult was brewing in the streets. An altercation had occurred between a soldier and a local in a shop. The discussion escalated and daggers were drawn. The king joined his soldiers whilst the people and the clergy of Augsburg fled into the cathedral. Though the bishop threw himself between the parties to stop the carnage, praying and pleading, Lothar ordered his soldiers to advance. What ensued was a massacre of the citizens seeking refuge in the church. Throughout the day and well into the night the army sent to serve the Holy Father murdered and raped, not showing any mercy for neither children nor nuns. This was not some hostile foreign stronghold. It was one of the major merchant cities in Germany. It had opened its gates to his king. And still, terrible violence was meted out. This is not an unusual occurrence. The long civil war had ground down people's moral boundaries. Violence had become commonplace. Leaving the smouldering ruins of Augsburg behind, the army travelled with relative ease down to Rome. It was again St. Bernard who had made that possible, by haranguing and harassing the major Italian cities. He could not get them to support the expedition, except for Pisa, Genoa and Cremona, but the Lombard cities promised not to attack the army. That meant it became an odd kind of imperial progress. No city was entered, nor was a coronation to be king of Italy in Monza or Pavia being celebrated. The army sort of snuck down the road, saying please and thank you, just trying to get to Rome in one piece. With the army, still only 2,000 men, the question rose what they were supposed to do when they get there. Sure, there were the great German knights, but still, no match or the even greater Norman ones. And that is when they hit a patch of good fortune. King Roger of Sicily suddenly found himself having to fight off a major rebellion. Coincidence? Maybe. Or some well-placed bags of gold coins from the papal purse. To everyone's surprise, the rebels were successful. They gave Roger a bloody nose and he had to shelter on the island of Sicily. No way he could help Anaclet II. Next piece of good news was that upon arrival in Rome, the Frangipani allies opened the city gates. Anaclet II retired to the right bank of the Tiber 
protected by the Castel San Angelo and the Theatre of Marcellus, whilst Innocent II and his Frangipani allies took the left bank. With Anaclet II holding St. Peter, the coronation could only take place in the Basilica of the Lateran. There, Lothar III and his wife Richesa were crowned Emperor and Empress on June 4, 1133. Note that date. It is June, and malaria season is kicking off. Anaclet is still sitting pretty, and Roger II is gradually gaining ground in southern Italy. Lothar thinks there is another opportunity to negotiate. A revision of the Concordat of Worms plus the lands of Matilda for the continuation of the campaign? And again, St. Bernard and his friend, Norbert the Archbishop of Magdeburg, put a spanner in the works. No revision of the Concordat, and as for the lands of Matilda, well, you can receive them as a papal vassal against a rent of a hundred mark of silver annually, but it is the property of the Pope, and whoever is Count of Tuscany has to do military service for him. Lothar, as so many times before, prefers a sparrow in his hand to a dove on the roof, and takes the offer. The position of Markgraf of Tuscany, greatest of Italian lords, is passed on to the imperial son-in-law, Henry the Proud, head of the House of Wealth. But it was not enough to make the emperor stay. The ink barely dry on the agreement, Lothar packed his bags and went home. If the Pope offers no more than basic service, well, all he gets back in return is basic service. Lothar's return was also the end of Innocent II's stay in Rome. A few weeks later, the Pier Leone had regained their position on the left bank, thanks to some excessive bribing, and Innocent had to leave the same route as three years earlier. So, nothing had really changed. Two years and an avalanche of letters from Bernard of Clairvaux later, Lothar was finally willing to do it properly. Negotiations had been ongoing despite the initial rebuttal, and the two sides found an arrangement that suited them. The Pope gave the Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen ecclesiastical oversight over all of Scandinavia, and the Archbishop of Magdeburg the same over Poland. Now that was new. Hamburg Bremen had forever dreamt of being the metropolitan church for the whole of the Baltic, and Magdeburg never had any oversight over Poland. It can be argued that Lothar saw a papal endorsement of the eastern expansion of the empire as something more valuable than positions in this extremely wealthy but unmanageable snake pit that was Italy. So it's not an unwinding of the Concord out of Worms, that's still a pretty good deal. In August 1136, a massive imperial host sets off from Würzburg to go after Roger of Sicily and Anaclet II, no longer just an expeditionary force, but a mighty host. Duke Henry the Proud alone brought 1,500 knights, there were five archbishops and 13 bishops, three abbots, the great Saxon nobles Conrad of Wittin and Albrecht de Baer, the Landgraf of Thuringen, and a whole host of counts and barons. And the bannerman of the emperor was none other than the former anti-king, Conrad of Hohenstaufen. Lothar was so convinced of his suppression of the Hohenstaufen ambitions, he allowed Conrad's brother, Frederick, Duke of Swabia, to stay behind in Germany. This was a very different proposition than last time round. Lothar had an army that not only could, but was very much intent on defeating the upstart Sicilian Roger II. This time, he comes as a leader of a unified empire, intent on projecting this power in Italy. Lothar's position in northern Italy had also improved. Thanks to St. Bernard's relentless travelling and preaching, all the Italian cities had now sided with Innocent II and Lothar. The most committed supporters were still the citizens of Pisa. Pisa had a particular side interest in the defeat of Roger II. At the time, Pisa competed with three other maritime republics, Venice, Genoa and Amalfi, for the lucrative Mediterranean trade. Amalfi had become part of Roger's kingdom. Now Amalfi, if you've ever been, is one of the most beautiful small towns in Italy, just south of Naples. In 977, travellers described Amalfi as the most prosperous, most illustrious and most wealthy of cities in the Lombard duchies, much more important than neighbouring Naples. Amalfi maintained trading posts across the Mediterranean, had a presence in Constantinople, 
as well as in Jerusalem and Antioch. Now the reason it is a small town today and not a thriving metropolis is an attack by the Pisan navy in 1135 and then again in 1137. The Amalfitani insist it was treachery that helped the Pisans to capture and destroy their fleet. They entered the undefended city and burned and looted so comprehensively Amalfi never came back from this catastrophe. Okay, now back to Lothar. He held an assembly for the Italian realm and a muster on the fields of Roncaglia outside Piacenza. There the plan for the attack on Roger II is agreed. To ease its progress, the army is split in two, one led by Lothar, the other by Henry the Proud. Lothar would travel along the eastern side of the Italian peninsula towards Puglia, while Henry would follow the western shore. Once Henry had reached Grosseto, Innocent II joined his army, and the two men promptly fell out. Not over some issue of compassion for your fellow man, the nature of divinity or even the state of Saxon monasteries. No, it was over money, cold, hard cash. The army had passed by the city of Viterbo, who had paid 3,000 pounds of silver for not having their land plundered, their peasants killed and their daughters raped. Now the question arises, whose money is it? The Dukes, who commands the troops, or the Popes, who, I don't know, has a moral high ground? Henry did not know either, and without Bernard of Clairvaux on hand to muddle the argument, the Pope relented. After the disagreement, the army pressed further south, passing just outside the walls of Rome without entering the Holy City. It's not known what Innocent thought about that. The Pope would become even more irritated when they passed the famous ancient abbey of Monte Cassino. Inside, the monks had been squabbling over who they should elect as abbot, a supporter of Anaclet or a supporter of Innocent. Henry made a deal with the supporter of Anaclet that he would change sides and pay him 400 marks of silver. Another event occurred at Benevento, where again Henry did what he thought best, not taking into account any papal wishes. Innocent II was not happy. Not happy at all. Did I mention that Henry's nickname was the Proud? Well, it was a character trait that would cost him dearly, very dearly. At the same rate as Henry the Proud was losing friends and alienating people, another man saw a huge improvement in his standing. Many a city fell to the mighty sword of Conrad of Hohenstaufen, the former arch-enemy of the Emperor. The whole army and even Lothar himself praised him for his prowess and his newfound loyalty. The two armies had by now made significant inroads into Roger's southern Italian possessions. They reunited in the city of Bari in Puglia, one of the most important harbours on the Adriatic. The citizens who detested Roger's autocratic regime had opened their gates to the imperial papal army. The citadel, however, was still held by the Norman garrison. I say Norman, but in reality most of the soldiers were Saracens, Muslim inhabitants of Sicily. The Normans had decided to allow their Muslim and Jewish subjects to retain their religion, in part because mass conversion was simply not enforceable, and also because they levied a special tax on the non-Christians. In return, the Saracen guard were amongst the most loyal troops of Roger II. They held out inside the citadel until the besiegers had dug out the foundations of the castle walls and brought them to collapse. Once inside, the Germans gave no quarter. The 500 men who had not been cut down or had drowned in the sea were hanged. The fall of Bari was a disaster for Roger II. His rule was unpopular, particularly on the mainland, and as news arrived of his defeat, many a city was keen to surrender to the emperor. Roger II opened negotiations, offering to split his kingdom, letting Puglia and Calabria be run by his sons. But Lothar refused, or had to refuse, because there was no real agreement between him and the Pope what to do with southern Italy. As the Pope and the Empress surveyed their success, the underlying differences came to the fore. The Pope had firmly believed the Emperor would help him out of a sense of duty. As Gregory VII had made clear, the emperor, like any other king, was the pope's vassal 
and owed him service. Lothar, on the other hand, saw himself as the guardian of the church, but that meant also that he had the secular power over all of Italy. He looked back to the days when the empress last went down to southern Italy, during the days of Henry III and even Otto the Great. There was no doubt for him who was the overlord of these lands. The conflict that had been brewing for a while became apparent to the whole army when the two sides fell out over the appointment of the new Duke of Puglia. Both sides wanted the same man, but each insisted it was their right to invest him. In the end, they came up with a silly compromise. They would both hand over the ducal banner, the Pope holding the top of the shaft, the Emperor the bottom. A similar conflict arose over the still unconfirmed appointment of the abbot of Monte Cassino. What we see here is that even the most conciliatory approach to imperial papal relationship cannot prevent the fundamental question coming back to the fore, who is more senior, the Pope or the Emperor. As the army sheltered from the relentless heat in the hills outside Bari, the German lords became restless. They have been en route for months. Peace was in the air and that means it did not look as if there is any more plunder to be had. There was also little chance that they would receive any counties or duchies in Italy as long as the two principals were unsure about who was boss. That and some not so subtle bribery by Roger II and the army was going on strike. Many a lord upped sticks and headed back home. And as so often before, the great expedition achieved pretty much nothing. Bari reverted back to Roger II as soon as the last imperial tent had been taken down. The newly appointed Duke of Puglia was back in exile within weeks. Anaclet II was still in Rome. And Innocent II was now very suspicious of the intentions of his allies. Unreliable is what they were, and disobedient at every junction. And who was the worst of the lot? Henry the Proud, of course. That stingy bastard withheld his money and had now turned on his heel to get back home to his cold and foggy hovel. Lothar III was 71 years old and tired. The Italian climate did not suit him and he wanted to get home. Against his friend's advice, Lothar dragged himself across the Alps in the midst of winter. He made it to the other side, just... He died on December 3rd, 1136, in a peasant's hut in the tiny village of Breitenschwang in Tyrol. On his deathbed, he handed the imperial regalia, the crown, the holy lands, and all the other signs of imperial rule to his son-in-law, Henry the Proud, who he designated as his successor, asking the nobles of the realm to elect him. Lothar III was buried in the church of Königslutter, which he had ordered to be built. Much more modest than a salient family mausoleum in Speyer, it is still a remarkable building. When they opened his grave in 1618, they found a lead plaque with the following inscription. Lothar, by the grace of God Emperor and forever Augustus, reigned for twelve years, three months and three days. He was always trusting in the Lord, a truthful, steadfast and peace-loving man and a fearless warrior. He died on December 3rd on return from Puglia where he defeated the Saracens. The counterpoint to this eulogy is a frieze on the outside of the church, showing hunting scenes. The central panel depicts two very aggressive-looking hares who have overcome the huntsman and are tying him up. I leave it to you to decide whether this depiction of a topsy-turvy world or the standard eulogy is the most suitable comment on Lothar's reign. And just one more piece of epilogue. Anaclet II died shortly after Lothar, and so Innocent II finally gained control of Rome. Once installed in the Lateran Palace, Innocent had a fresco painted on the wall, showing Lothar III receiving the imperial crown on his knees from the Pope. Underneath it says, And so the king became a vassal of the Pope before receiving his crown. It's all a question of perspective, I presume. Next week, we will leave Lothar behind and look at the next election contest between a Welf, Henry the Proud, and a Hohenstaufen, our friend Conrad, now on his second attempt. Lots of twists and turns to come. And in the meantime, should you feel like supporting the show and get hold of those bonus episodes, 
sign up on Patreon. The links are in the show notes or on my website at historyofthegermans.com. <laughs>